Did you ever get to talk to your parents, perhaps your mom, about sex? Um, thank you, Toyin. Um, you know, when I was about 12 years old, my mom gifted me a book on my birthday. The book was titled, Everything a Boy Should Know. Uh, it contained pages and pictures about sexual and reproductive issues. But the challenge is that many children, before they even enter their teenage years, are already curious and have a general knowledge about sexuality. And if a parent wants to have that conversation, they might want to start much earlier than when I got my book. Uh, the data shows that most child sexual abuses begin to happen between the ages of three and eight years old. And added to that, that young uh, children become aware of changes in their body that have to do with sexuality around the age of 10. So I think parents should be open to their children from an early age. And while my mom gave me a book, we never talked. And the problem might also be that many parents themselves were not raised with open communication, so they repeat the pattern with their children. But, you know, if parents don't talk with their children about sex and sexuality and their bodies and what's going on in the world, their children will learn it from the Internet, from television and their peers, and the results may be out of our control. But she, I, I guess she was good enough to give you a book. Yeah, the book is good, but you know the thing I'm saying is that children do have theoretical knowledge. You may think they are they are young, and therefore that means they are dumb, but they have theoretical knowledge. We shouldn't overlook that. What they need is understanding and context. And the parents, from their experience of the world, I think we should get to a point where we are open-minded enough to ask the child what's going on in your life, or if you notice a trend or an issue that should bring conversation, tell me about that, and then help them to have that confidence. You know why this is important. If all they have is a book. It will not help them on the day they have a challenge. They are not going to trust you to talk to you because you gave them a book. But if, if they have had a conversation with you in the past, a candid conversation about sex, that creates trust. And trust is the platform or the basis for a child to come back when they have a problem and tell their parents. Not books. Trust that comes from, from person to person conversation. So how can we begin to change the conversation we have about sex? Yeah, that's a very fundamental fundamental question. I think, I have been thinking that we need to start from our mindsets. And in particular, we need to begin to dissociate sex from morality. Um, many Nigerians have an ingrained association between sex and morality. And that, that association is compounded by religion and culture. We cannot think about sex without thinking about whether it's good or bad or whether it makes a person good or bad. Uh, we extend that same... Um, more, uh, morality about non-moral things, to hair, to dressing, smoking, drinking. We automatically infer a person's level of decency or morality by all of these things, and they have nothing to do specifically with goodness or badness, as the case may be. So we need to question our assumptions. We need to understand that morality is, is mostly a subjective issue, and that sex, that the sex and the conversations that we need to have about sex are biological issues and social issues, primarily. Um, if we get to that point, then our minds can be free. Um, one example I can give is, how do you talk about, uh, about fire? Fire can be used to cook food and can be used to burn down a house. How do you talk about money? Money can be used to buy good things for you or to bribe the police. Sex, likewise, can be used for pleasure and can be used for abuse. Mm. So if we have that mindset, if we have that mindset, a parent can discuss sex with their child without having any level of stress or shyness, or shame, or stigma. They can discuss sex with their children without replacing technical words like penis or vagina with that thing. It doesn't help a child because there's shame embedded in euphemisms, and it's shame that prevents the child in future from talking back to the parents. So if we change our mindset about what the origin and basis of sex and sexuality is or are, then we can start having open conversations before children learn from avoidable mistakes. Mm, that's excellent. Now, did the abuse make you feel guilty, and how did you deal with it? Actually, I didn't. I felt nothing, and the reason I felt nothing was because I buried the experience after it happened. So I did not recall the experience for many years. So that happened when I was fourteen, and it was only last year. I was going through counselling with a friend of mine, 
who is uh, a qualified psychotherapist, and she was she was dealing with general childhood issues, mm. uh, the trauma that we face as children, maybe either emotionally or otherwise, and somehow we stumbled on this memory. And the way I remembered it and recounted it to her was not as an abuse. I simply said, you know, my teacher and I had a spiritual exchange. Mm. And this, this lady said, um, my dear, this thing you are describing to me is not a spiritual exchange. It is child sexual abuse. And for the first time, I felt shocked because I hadn't seen it that way. And there are many reasons why not, including the fact that I'm a boy and boy ch children are not raised to see themselves in the victim position. Mm -hmm. And also, I was, a very sp I was a very religious person. So I just automatically assumed that, just like teacher was saying, this is the Holy Spirit ministering to me. Um, so now that I'm beginning to deal with the real sensations of it, I remember the fear that I felt at the time and how I felt paralyzed to be alone with her and have no way out. It was a dark room. And my perception of her as an authority figure, as what you call mother in Israel, mm. didn't help me. Didn't help me to take a stand or to face my own fear. So I basically gave in to it at the time. And that's how children or other people who are in vulnerable positions give in to people who have power over them. And that's what enables um, sexual abuse. So you didn't deal with it at that time. It was years later when we were older. Yeah, I buried it. And most people who are in traumatic conditions bury it so that it can survive. It's a natural response of the human body and mind to bury things that are uncomfortable so people can survive. Now this brings me to my next question. You know the conversation is usually about men assaulting young girls, but in your case it was a trusted older woman. How did the rea realization make you feel? Yeah, that's a very important question, Toy. You know, as, as boys and as men and male children, we are socialized as men to see ourselves as being in charge, including in sexual situations. It's, it's difficult for a man to see himself as receiving. Uh, we, we, we are raised to understand that men play the active role in sex and women receive sex, or that men enjoy sex and men cannot be forced. Um, in fact, someone was responding to this issue and used all this to, you know, to say, how can you say you didn't enjoy it? Those are, those are not very intelligent ways of understanding what happens to a child in that situation of power and control. Um, how the, I realized also that for underage children and boys in particular, they easily misread and overlook abuse as sexual enjoyment. If you look at it, what many boys refer to as their, sex, their first sexual experience or sexual debut in 80% of cases, it's actually a case of child sexual abuse, but they don't see it that way. I myself didn't see it until years had passed. If you look at the data also, it says that over 120 million children between the ages of 2 and 17 have already experienced sexual abuse. And that the rates of child sexual abuse for girls is highest in Australia at 21%, and highest for boys, surprisingly, in Africa at 19 percent mm. so this these things are going on but they are covered by our cultural perception of what it means to be a man in a sexual situation other um other data reveals that before the age of 18 one in four girls have been have experienced sexual violence and one in 10 boys so it's going on it's going on in the background um so the way it made me feel is that i wasn't wise enough as a child to determine that I could be a victim. And that also speaks to the idea that children, uh, teachers, and culture and schools in general need to help all of us understand that any sexual contact between a minor, someone who is less than 18, who cannot make um, informed choices, and someone who is older than them is, uh, is abusive and has its own consequences. Ah, well, so did you at some point try to tell anybody, or did you try to resist? Um, no, I, I told no one, um, and I, in that situation, I did what she told me to do. I trusted her, and I think trust is the thing that people in that situation exploit. Like, similar to the story that was trending about the pastor of Koza and the Busola Dakolo. One, has, the person already has trust in you, so you draw them in, and then you have power over them. So all of those issues, are um, they're leveraged. Mm -hmm. So I didn't tell anyone. I did what I was told. She told me that the Holy Spirit was leading her. I wanted to be closer to the Holy Spirit, and that overwhelmed any other understanding. Um, and I was also, I was relatively sexually naive at that age. I didn't have any well-developed sexual interests in women. I was naive. So a lot of things were used against me. And um, 
I think the other lesson I learned about not resisting or not talking is that those who listen to these cases should not project their own expectations or misconceptions to the victim. Some people have said to me, oh, why didn't you shout? Why didn't you jump up? Why didn't you speak out? Why didn't you resist? That is what you think you would do. But until you're in that situation, you are really not, not in a position to predict what a victim does. You should not generalize in unhelpful ways when a survivor speaks to you about their own abuse. Mm. So why do you think speaking up is very important? Yeah, thank you, Toyin. Um, speaking up in a general sense is an important part of growing up. Um, for instance, if children and parents between themselves speak up about sex, it might actually help the communication between parents and children in other ways. Because sex is complex, and if you can pass that limitation to have open conversations about it, then I cannot imagine any other thing that you need to talk about now and in the future with your child or with your parent that will be hard for you. For instance, there are very many other issues that Nigerians of today need to be having candid conversations about. Apart from parenting, there is um, women's rights, there is uh, gender roles, there is religion, there is sexuality, there is uh, aspects of politics like Biafra, there is restructuring. These are Some of these things are technically uh, complex issues. And I suspect sometimes that because of the way we are raised to not deal with difficult topics and tec technically uh, difficult issues, we are now not having very successful conversations about all the complex social and political issues that